Hello, welcome again, Peninsula Student Ministries. Thanks for joining us uh, for uh, what would have been a Sunday night talk uh, for our student ministry night. We're going to talk about uh, the idea of can we earn our salvation? And if we can't earn our salvation on our own, then why are we supposed to have good works in our lives? What is the purpose of that? And so uh, in order to kind of set the stage, I wanted to share with you about one of my favorite movies of all time. It's actually, in my opinion, one of the greatest movies of all time, but it also has the worst ending of all time. And the name of the movie is Saving Private Ryan. Now, I'm going to date myself a little bit here. This movie came out in my senior year of high school. And it's actually a small piece of one of the reasons that I majored in history in college and then became a history teacher for 13 years. The movie takes place during World War II. And the plot of the movie is that there is uh, a character named Private Ryan. And Private Ryan has gone off to Europe with two of his brothers to fight in World War II, to fight against the Nazis. And Ryan's two brothers are killed in action. And so the State Department, or I should say the War Department, finds out about this, that here is this brother, uh, this, this, the private named uh, Preber Ryan and his two brothers go off to war. The two brothers die, and the War Department doesn't want Private Ryan to die also along with his other two brothers, and so that this mother loses all three of her sons in one war. And so the War Department has this plan where they are going to send the Army Rangers into, I think it's France, to rescue Private Ryan so they can bring him home safely so that his mother doesn't lose all three of her sons. Now, the only problem is, is that Private Ryan was a part of the D-Day invasion, and very few of the soldiers ended up exactly where they were supposed to end up. And so, Captain John Miller has to trek across all, all across France to find Private Ryan and to bring him back. And along the way, Captain John Miller loses a lot of his men. Man after man after man dies as they're fighting the Nazis along the way, just trying to locate Private Ryan so they can bring him home safely on this rescue mission. And at the end of the movie, spoiler alert, at the end of the movie, Captain Miller is shot by the Nazis, and he is dying as they're trying to defend this bridge to get Private Ryan out of France. And as he's dying, Private Ryan comes up to him, and Captain John Miller looks up at Private Ryan, and in his dying breath, he says to Private Ryan, Earn this. Earn this. And what he means is we have died to save you. Now you need to go earn what we have given you. And the reason that this crushes me is because it is completely contrary to the Christian faith. It is completely contrary to what we believe to be the core message of Christianity, which is that we can do nothing to earn our salvation. God sent his son to die for us. Jesus sacrificed his sinless life for us. And there is absolutely nothing that we can do to earn or to merit that. In order to make this point clear, we're going to look at uh, Titus chapter 2 today. I'm going to read verses 11 through 15 of Titus chapter 2. So if you would follow along with me. It says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness 
and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Please pray with me. Father, we again come to you and we need you, God, to speak to us. Father, these students do not need to hear from me today. My words are empty. My words uh, cannot give life. But God, my desire and my prayer is that they would hear you speak through your word in the book of Titus today, Father, that they would hear uh, the words of the Apostle Paul, which are your words spoken through him and spoken to us, Father, written nearly 2,000 years ago, but as applicable today as they were then. And so, Father, would you help us to put aside distractions? Would you help us put aside stresses? Would you help us uh, to lay our worries, our anxieties, our fears at the foot of the cross right now, Father, so that we may understand more of you, God? We pray these things in your Son's name. Amen. Well, verse 11 in Titus 2 tells us, For the grace of God has appeared. And this should lead us to ask the question, what is grace? Grace is a free gift of God. Grace is free and undeserved. And unlike something that you earn, which we would call wages, if you work a job and you get a check at the end of the day, that's not a gift. Those are your wages. That's something that you have earned. Then we talk about grace being the free gift of God. What do you do to earn a gift? The, the answer is nothing. Because if you do anything, then it's no longer a gift. Grace is free and it is undeserved. You don't deserve it. And grace is given for the forgiveness of our sins. And that is something that God gives us daily. You see, grace isn't just a one-time gift that he gives us. He does give it. There is an initial point in your life where he gives you grace for the first time. But then the believer is given grace day after day after day. We have to daily look to the cross for grace. Because you and I are in daily need of God's grace. And it says that it brings salvation for all people. Well, how is God's grace given? We know that it's free and it's undeserved, but the mode of it is it is given through His Son, Jesus Christ. God appears through His Son who died to make peace between us and God. You see, because of our sin, fellowship between us and God has been broken. And Jesus has come to restore that relationship so that we no longer have to be ashamed in the presence of God because our sin is no longer counted against us. Our sins are forgiven. And so we can stand boldly in God's presence, knowing that Christ is our advocate, that he speaks on our behalf because he has given us that grace. If we are in Christ, then we can live in daily fellowship with him. And we can find our satisfaction in Him daily. And there will be joy in our lives when we are in God's presence. We can't earn our salvation. This is so clear. It is a gift. We do not deserve it, but it is given to us. So then what do we do with all of these directives or these commands in Scripture that tell us to live holy lives? Because that's one of the things that Paul is getting ready to do. He is explaining that grace is a free gift. The grace of God has appeared, he says in verse 11. It brings salvation to the world. But then in 12, he's going to get into ways that we should be living. And so I want to tell you that you cannot earn your salvation. But we are called to righteousness because of what Christ has done for us. So what does it look like to not earn this, but what does it look like to live a life worthy of the calling that God has put on our lives? And this is what Paul says in verse 12. He says, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live 
self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. As we live before the cross of Jesus in our daily lives, we are to be living in a daily dependence on Jesus. And what will happen if, as you live in a daily dependence on Jesus, you will become more and more conformed to the character of Jesus. You will resemble Christ more as you rely on him more. And this means that you will love the things that God loves. Examine your life for a moment. Examine the things that you spend your time on, that you spend your money on, that you give your passion to. Are they the things that God loves? Because if you are living in dependency on Christ daily, you will love the things that God loves. You will love peace. You will love justice. You will love hope. You will love these things. You will love reconciliation. You will love obedience, but you will also hate the things that God hates. And so when you examine your life, are you, do you love the things that God loves? And do you hate the things that God hates? Do you hate anger? Do you hate jealousy? Do you hate envy? Do you hate lust? Do you hate the things that God hates? We will also begin to respond to his commands with joy and obedience. When you come across a command in scripture, is your reaction, Ugh, do I have to do that? Or when you come across a command in scripture, do you respond with, yes, Jesus, that is the way that I want to live. I want to live in obedience to you. Do you find joy in obeying God? Or is it a burden? And also, examine your life. When you get disciplined by God, do you hate His discipline? Or do you realize and accept God's discipline in your life as something that will help you produce more fruit in your life? Because one of the things that we hear in Scripture is that He prunes those that He loves. And if you use this analogy of gardening, sometimes you have to cut away certain things in your life. And it hurts sometimes to cut away those certain sins in your lives. And, oh, I don't want to let go of that thing. You think and you're deceived by Satan that it's bringing some sort of peace or some sort of joy in your life. And so when God starts to cut away and discipline and to root out some of those sins in your life, it can be hard. It can be painful. But do you accept it? Do you welcome it? Because you know that it will produce more fruit in your lives. Verse 13 says, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, we have a hope, a future hope, that when we meet God face to face at the end of our time, that we will be covered by the blood of Jesus. That we will stand before a righteous and a holy God and we will be declared not guilty. And we will be declared not guilty on the basis of Christ's work for us. Do you believe that you will be covered by the blood of Jesus? We call this future grace. You see, Christ, God extends grace to us at the moment of salvation, when we put our faith and our trust in Christ, a grace has been extended to us that saves us. And then daily in our lives, He extends grace to us on a daily basis. If we live our lives in dependence of Jesus and His work on the cross, if we live our lives, we like to use the language sometimes, if we live at the foot of the cross, we can daily experience His grace, His forgiveness of sins. We should be confessing sins to him every day. But there is also a future grace that he has stored up for us. A future grace that when we meet him face to face, we will be declared not guilty. This is a hope that should encourage us to walk by faith and not by feelings. 
Our feelings can often deceive us. Our, our, our emotions can get us all tangled up sometimes. But when we study the Word of God, we can see how we are supposed to be living, and we can read about truth that we can trust. And we're to be doing this as we are waiting for our blessed hope. In verse 14, Paul says, who gave himself for us to redeem from all lawlessness. One way that we can identify with Jesus is by the fruit that we're bearing in our lives. One way that we can identify as, hey, I am following Jesus. We, If we're making that claim that, hey, I, I am a follower of Jesus, then we should be producing fruit in our lives. Fruit should be bared in our lives. Saying Just saying that we follow Jesus and bearing no fruit is not a good sign. He should be redeeming us from all lawlessness. We need to be submitting ourselves to God. And as we submit ourselves to God, He frees us from rebellion. The way that we constantly rebel against God, He frees us from that. He frees us from our self-centered desires. So many of us believe that we are the center of the universe and everything revolves around us and it is about me, 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 me. That's lawlessness, y'all. That's you living for your glory, not God's glory. And when you are freed from your rebellion, when you are freed from all of your self-centered desires, you will bear fruit in your lives. And so is your life marked by sin only? Or are you bearing love in your life, joy, peace, patience, godliness, Are these things that are coming out of you? Because he goes on in verse 14 to say, and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. When we commit to Jesus, when we come to put our faith and our trust in Jesus, we have a radical change in our identity. You see, apart from Christ, we are friends with the world. We do the things that the world says will bring us fulfillment, will bring us joy, will bring us happiness. And we know that those are lies. The greed, the envy, the jealousy, the the, the strife, these things do not bring any completion to our lives. They draw us further from God. And so we can't be friends of the world and friends of God at the same time because when we are friends of the world, we are against Christ. And when we're against Christ, God is our enemy. But if you are in Christ, you are God's treasured possession. Do you feel like a treasured possession? Do you feel that your life has purpose and meaning? Because if you are a daughter or a son of the beloved king, then you should feel that way. You should know that Christ is for you, that God is with us, and we are his heir to the promises of Christ. We have eternal life in Jesus. And this fact This truth, this reality should spur you on towards good works. It's not good works so that I can earn my salvation. It is because of what Christ has done for me, I am able to do good works that glorify Him. Because He has rooted out the evilness, because He has rooted out the sin in my life, I am now able to live a life that glorifies God. And I am bearing fruit in my life. We can see this when he says, declare these things. Are you declaring these things? Are you exhorting? And rebuke all authority. And it says, let no one disregard you. Some of you are not even putting yourselves out there so that you can be disregarded. You're just flying low under the radar, hoping nobody notices. 
If Christ has changed your life, then people should notice. And we need to, as members of one body, we need to comfort each other. We need to encourage each other to abide in Jesus. And we need to commit all things to him. I mentioned earlier that I hated how the movie Saving Private Ryan ended. With the words that are so contrary to the core of the Christian message, when Captain Miller looks at Private Ryan and says, earn this. I said it crushed me because we cannot earn anything except for God's wrath. That's the only thing that we deserve is God's condemnation because the only thing that we can produce with our own hands is sin. I wish the movie had ended with Captain Miller looking into John, uh, Private Ryan's eyes and saying to him, we have all died for you. We started off trekking through France. We've been picked off one by one by the Nazis. And now here I am, the leader of this group of men, and I am dying. And as he's breathing his last breath, I wish that he looked in Private Ryan's eyes and said, don't waste your life. Because there is nothing that Private Ryan could do to deserve these men laying their lives down for him. But with that reality that someone has died for you, that someone has laid down their life for you, your reality is that the God of the universe saw you while you were yet in your sins and sent Jesus to die for you. A sacrifice has been made. As Jesus was hanging on that cross and the blood was spilling out of him, he was thinking of you. If you do not feel loved in this moment, then you don't know the reality of what Jesus has done for you. You should feel so loved that the God of the universe would leave his throne on high, that he would come down, enter our sinful humanity, and he would live a perfect life for 33 years on this world, never committing a sin, even though he was tempted in all of the ways that we were tempted. And then he allowed himself to be hung on a cross with nails driven through his hands and through his feet. All because of the love that he has for you. And Jesus Christ never looked down from the cross and says, earn this. Jesus does not look down from his throne in heaven and say, I died for you. Now you need to go earn it. Instead, as he is hanging on the cross, the words that Jesus utters is, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And so, PSM, my challenge to you is that the God of the universe has died for you. Now, don't waste it. Live in such a way that your life would reflect the truth that Jesus has paid it all and he has given it to you freely. Will you pray with me? Father, for anyone hearing this teaching that has not put their faith and trust in you, I pray that this would be the moment of salvation, God. I have no way of knowing who's listening to this video, when watching it. I don't know. But I know and I trust God that you send Jesus to die for us. And so I pray, Father, that we would cling to that truth in this moment, whether for the first time or the thousandth time in our life, Father, would we hold firmly to the cross. Would we put our faith and our trust in you, Jesus, so that we would know that the world has nothing to offer us but pain, suffering, sin, torment, despair? That's what the world offers. That's all that Satan can give to us. 
but through you, Father, you offer us eternal life. And so I pray, God, that we would be changed in such a way that we would be conformed more and more to your character, God, that you would shape us more and more into the likeness of Christ, and that we would live for you bearing fruit in our lives. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen.